the strike of a light boat. I just air it out and leave with the mic broke. The micro, I'm hard body like Tycho. I heavy metal Chevys with nitro. Addicted to the papers of paper, hypnotic to the thirst. I'm pulling off criminal capers. I know the cocaine cracker is stinks, but that's what it is. Surrounded by the khakis and mints. We move. Okay, welcome back to a very special episode of Ratchet and Clank, uh, Up Your Arsenal Developer Commentary. I am Tony Garcia. And I'm Mike Stout. And I just want to note that I'm not making fun of the way you introduced the, to- the show, Tony. That's because I did it well. That's why I'm not <laughs> making fun of it. All right, but what are we doing here? Well, this one is going to be a very interesting episode, just because uh, just this last uh, weekend... Uh, we put up a video where we basically just gave our thoughts on the state of the industry in general, uh, where we thought things were going, and, uh, you know, just general, just talking about uh, our feelings about what it's like to be working in games right now. Right. And uh, the response was pretty overwhelming, I have to say. I think we got more comments in the first 24 hours than we'd ever gotten on anything else that we posted. That's fair to say, yeah. It's a, a, a lot of people really curious about a lot of different things. Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of questions. Like, more questions than I think I've, we'd, I've seen on any of our videos so far. And uh, I, w- I was personally really astounded that uh, the questions all seem to be very well-reasoned, rational questions. Which, on the internet, I'm not very used to. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was actually pretty grateful for that. Yeah, I was really impressed, and I was really impressed with the with the people that were taking the time to comment on our videos and ask us these questions that I thought were were valid questions to a lot of things that we had said, and I felt that we owed them an explanation for saying the things that we had said, uh, because I think we did leave a lot of things hanging, and uh, just so people know, there were some things that we actually cut out of that video, um, just because looking back on it, uh, I personally wasn't comfortable with some of the things that I said, so we cut it out. But we're going to try to go into a little bit more depth about the things that we were talking about and really just answer the questions that people asked. And the reason we're doing this now is because we actually have, I think, what, three, four episodes in the can already, Mike? I think so. There's at least that many, yeah. So if we didn't just sort of put this one episode in here out of order, uh, it would be about three to four weeks before we would actually get around to answering these questions. And we felt that was a little bit disrespectful to people that actually took the time to watch our videos and ask us these questions. So we wanted to get to it a little bit more quickly. And some of these we've answered, but we we think that it would be pretty good for everybody here, so we're just going to go over them. Yeah. So uh, we're going to have, going on in the background, Mike's just going to be going around farming sewer crystals. Uh, It's really not going to be relevant to what we're talking about, I don't think. It's entirely Uh, possible that we'll stumble across something really important. Right. Well, I mean, if something bad happens, I might just be ashamed and call it out. <laughs> but I'm going to try to not let that happen, and we're just going to try to stay on point Because everyone through these questions. Everyone needs to remember, Tony, that you coded this level. That's right. I did. This is, I had this a, is very important to this. I had a very heavy hand in a lot of the stuff that went on in this level. So anything that goes wrong in the background, it's probably my fault. And if I don't acknowledge it, it's not that I didn't see it. It's just that I'm trying to stay on point. Uh, so uh, we're just going to get started. We're just going to go in at the top. This one's from Mr. Fraser Films 2009. I have a question. What do you guys think about publishers in general? <laughs> Very general question. Mike, what it, do you uh, think about publishers in general? It says also, unless rule number one also applies to publishers, then you don't have to answer. Yeah, I figured I'd leave that out, but the, just to put you on the hot spot. Well, you're you're uh, you're not really putting me on the hot spot. I mean, I work for a publisher, uh, so like I think they're great because they employ me. <laughs> uh, but to a certain extent, they employ everybody in the games industry. I mean, like you know, not uh, uh, independent games have sort of their own thing, and uh, uh, you know, there's there's other funding models. But as far as you know, if you want to make a game, what do you do? It's still the dominant model. For sure. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of times, like what you read about in the news, uh, as far as you know, what publishers are and what they contribute to the industry, isn't really that accurate. Like, uh, like in general, uh, what happens is a publisher wants to make a game. They find a developer and they say, you know, will you make this game? How much money can you make this game for? And then 
they make it, right? It's sort of like uh, contract work, right? Or, uh, you know, being a wedding photographer. You know, it's hard for me to understand when people say that they're, they're super smothering and stuff. I mean, even when we were working with Sony, that wasn't so much the case. Just like everything else, there's, you got to take some good with the bad. And publishers, as of right now, serve a very important purpose that you're not going to get anywhere, anywhere else. Funding expensive video games. All your Assassin's Creeds, your Calls of Duty, your Halos. Your Marios and Zeldas. Right. Those would not exist at this point in time uh, outside of the traditional publisher model because they're too expensive and there's not a lot of people out there that are willing to fund them. Um, maybe that will change, but as of right now, uh, they serve a very important purpose. Sometimes there's bad things, but, you know... That that just comes. That's just part of the. Uh, that's just part of the package that you have to deal with. Yeah, I mean, if you were to ask us about publishers in specific, I'm sure we'd have things to say. But <laughs> publishers in general, I mean, that's right. Like it's it's like asking what you think about movie studios in general if you work in the movie industry. Exactly. I yeah. Ex I think you. I think you got it as succinct as we can possibly say it. All right. Uh, let's just move on to the next one, and this one might be better for you because okay. you probably you have a little bit more experience in this than I do. Can you do stuff on pitching ideas to game companies? I know that there's lots of different sectors, and the writing staff, which is my point of interest, probably are as important as the developers, but I'm just curious as to what it takes to get signed on to a team. Uh, that's two different questions. Uh, I think we covered sort of getting into the game industry in the other episode, so let's just focus on the first part of this question, and uh, let's do stuff on pitching stuff to game companies, Mike. Nobody pitches anything to game companies. What do you like, mean nobody pitches anything to game companies? Like, uh, well, okay, if you work at a game company, you get to pitch things, right? But if you're, if you don't, like, you don't, nobody, nobody comes up and knocks on Ubisoft's door and says, I've got an idea for a billion seller, and you're, you know, when you hear this, you're going to want to pay me a bunch of money. Like, that, that never happens. That has mm -hmm. never happened. Uh, what does happen is you've already got a job at a game developer, or you are a game developer's studio and you're pitching your idea to whoever's going to give you the money. Uh, right. So those two situations do exist, but the the idea of pitching a game as a way of getting onto a team, it doesn't actually work that way in the in the game industry. This is a bold statement, but I'm going to say it. Nobody will ever get a job at a game studio because you have a great idea for a video. No, everybody has a million great ideas for video games. It, it's never going to be valuable enough what, what people will buy from you is your execution. Yes, indeed. So in terms of pitching ideas, um, it's all about being on the game studio, climbing the ladder, getting high enough on the totem pole to where uh, people around you are interested in maybe pitching together to come up with an idea and then pitching that idea to publishers. And even then, it's never going to be your idea. It will be the team's idea. Right. So uh, this is going to sound very cruel, but... You will never make your game. I think you that's will, fair. It will always be a collaborative process, and if, that's how games are made. Assuming that you're not making the game by yourself, yes. Yes, yeah. indeed. Uh, uh, let's just move on to the next one. I think uh, we've significantly well, th shattered Super Mumble <laughs> 360's dreams. I think there was one more question in there, uh, though. Uh, there was a bit, it sounded like he was interested in writing. Yes. And I, I think at least we could talk a bit about what the role of writing and writers is in a game, since he sounds like he's interested in... I, I work with writers as a designer. Uh, I, I don't write myself, but I've worked with a fair few. And generally speaking, they're, they're people who already worked at the company, and they are good at writing, so they became the writer, right? Or they needed a writer... They say, hey, we want a guy who's done games before, or we want a, a gal who's done movies before. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're usually looking for something like that. So right. cross experience can help. But generally speaking, at this point, like, the writer's a guy on the team a lot of time. Like, and it depends on what studio you're at. I mean, Double Fine probably does story a lot differently than Insomniac did, right? Yes. Well, uh, Double Fine's also an interesting uh, situation because... Uh, our writer is Tim Schafer. Right. Uh, so, I mean, you have a that's, a... that's a hurdle to climb to become <laughs> a writer at Double Fine. Because you have to do write outright Tim Schafer, is that why? Right, exactly. 
<laughs> you would be hard pressed to find a better games writer. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really have much more than that. Okay. I mean, that's that's a fine. Again, we I think uh, we've done enough to make Super Mumbles Mimbles be very sad uh, about <laughs> entering the games industry. All right. Uh, again, uh, just a really quick thing. Uh, we we're about at the midpoint. Midway point. Uh, we're not trying to be negative. Uh, we're just trying to be sort of realistic about our answers. Like we want to be honest, and uh, a lot of times being honest is not. Uh, very cool. Uh, the uh, the industry itself is not super glamorous. Uh, like it's real. It's a real thing that involves working with real people. Right. And a lot of times the answers are less satisfying than you'd want from a narrative standpoint. Right. So I mean, if we're coming off as negative, like we certainly don't mean to be, uh, but we feel like it's more important to be honest about what we think rather than trying to sugarcoat it and sort of, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I think that's just generally what we're, we're, we're getting at. Uh, here's another one uh, from Dread Ale. Uh, I'm one of three guys trying to make a commercial mid-range title in Unity 3D. From what you discussed during this episode, it seems like you don't think this is very viable right now. And I was wondering if you could elaborate. So I, um, I responded to that one. Uh, do you want to talk about sort of what you think first? Well, what I think, when you say you are three guys making a title in Unity 3D, that's not a mid-range game. That's an indie game. Uh, I mean, that's it's an indie game. Like right. Mid-range game. That, that's not what we were talking about when we said mid-range games. Uh, right. We were talking about like thirty people, not three people. Yeah, we're talking about a, a, a few, you know, like two to five million dollars. Uh, right. Budget. Exactly. Uh, so if you're under two million dollar budget, that's not what we were referring to. Uh, and indie games, there is 100% a market for indie games. If you can go out there and you can execute and you can put it out there, there is certainly money to be made and it is certainly viable. Hell yeah. It's really just about that execution and sort of sticking with it and getting it done. Um, that's my opinion on the subject. So What we're talking about is that mid-ranged games that cost you know, somewhere in the 2 to $10 million range, just at this point can't make that amount of money back anymore you got to be right. got to be a, a game that's all or nothing at this point in order to make your money back i mean that uh, just last year the 90 percent of the money in the industry was made by the top 10 games that came out yeah like yeah. that it's not that's not just a made-up thing i mean that's that's what people bought last year right exactly so it's uh that's just yeah, that's just reality of the situation yeah i mean that's just the way it is um maybe we don't like it maybe we do like it it, it's just the way things are, and we have to live in that reality. Aw, um, Tony. Now, it, now it sounds like a bummer. Well, I don't mean it to be a bummer, but I'm saying, but what I'm saying is that um, if you want to make an indie game, like there's definitely a market for you there. Yeah, go and for it. You can go definitely for it, go for it, and uh, you know, make it happen. And all it all it really comes down to is being able to execute on your idea well, stick with it, and put it out there, and just sort of. See what happens. Um, so yeah, that's we weren't talking about you, Dread Ale. Uh, we think you should keep on doing what you're doing, and uh, I'm sure it's a fine, fun game. And if you want any feedback on it, send it to Tony. That's right. I'll, uh, hey, I'll give you feedback. Tony will totally be like, "Here's how you code the shit out of this thing." Uh, so let's go to Joe Luber. Uh, what do you both think of schools with degrees designed specifically for working the games industry? Many schools have, have outstanding track records of student projects. See Digipen, but I would love to take uh, love to hear your take on how they prepare students for working in the industry. Um, do you have anything to say on this? I, I I've hired quite a few designers from. A yeah, I mean, I here's what I'll say. I worked with a couple people, uh, a couple really standout people who came from places like Digipen. And yeah. Other people. Uh, a few like other uh, Ryan Juckett uh, came out of Dis Digipen. Like Ryan Juckett. And I was going to use him as an example because when I think about Ryan, it doesn't matter what school Ryan went to, he would be great at his job regardless. <laughs> he, it's because he's amazing. Yeah, for sure. I, I think Ivan also went to right. Full Sail or, uh, or DigiPen, one of those two. Uh, Jared, who we worked with, went to Right, uh, Drew, Drew Murray, the designer at uh, – uh, he's the one of the creative directors at Insomniac right now. He went to uh, – yeah. uh, and these are all Guild great Hall. developers, but I truly believe that these people would have been great game developers had they gone 
to any other university. Uh, it doesn't matter what university you went to. If you have it in you to make great games and you dedicate yourself to really learning how to make games properly, uh, you will be good at it. I, that's my that's my. I do on think they have that. I do think that people who have an education have an edge in that they have a uh, foot in the door. Uh, that yes. that's the main place that I think. Like, it also helps that you're familiar with the tools of the trade and generally how a production goes and stuff. But generally speaking, if you're coming out of the programs, the people in the industry are are assuming they're going to have to retrain you. Uh, like that's just sort of how it is. They're they're you know when they hire you, they're budgeting a certain amount of time to train you how to do your job, regardless of where you went. That will not change, right? No one's going to hire you and think. You're a superstar, except maybe Valve, and so far that's like <laughs> eight people. So probably not, right? Uh, for the most right. part, uh, uh, and and even probably if you get hired at Valve, there's a lot of mentoring that goes on. You know, like uh, so. Yeah. The main thing I would say is that it it definitely prepares you in the same way that college prepares you in any program, right? It pre it shows you what you need to do. And helps you build the skills that you need, and makes helps you look really good on paper, so that you can get that interview, so that you can show you're awesome, so that you can work really hard, learn your craft, and someday be a superstar. Uh, maybe even right. be a superstar right out the bat. I mean, that I've seen that happen a lot of times, and I have seen that happen a lot with people who've been in these programs. So, uh, yeah. So I mean, I, I think for sure, and the programs are certainly legitimate. Uh, they're respected as much as any other degree. Depending, uh, definitely not thought of less. Uh, if in some cases thought there of are, more, there are. Uh, I'm not going to talk shit about any particular program, no matter how much anyone asks me. But there are, like, do your research, do your due diligence before you find a program. Make sure that what they're claiming that they can do is real, and make sure that you know what what they're teaching is actually getting people jobs. Like you don't. Uh, like it's it's entirely possible to be defrauded, just like it is with any college that you're you're looking into. Make sure you do your homework. Don't just listen to their promises. That's yeah. just be smart about it. The way you'd be smart about anything you were going to spend ten of, tens of thousands of dollars on. Yeah, I have fair point. Um, but yeah, in terms of sort of DigiPen full sale, uh, if you're worried that they're a waste of money, they're not. Um, but just like everything else, you get out what you put in. Uh, it's not an automatic job just because you went to DigiPen or Full Sail. And if you can't, uh, if you can't draw, DigiPen is not going to make you a 3D modeler of the highest caliber overnight. You know what I mean? Like, right. uh, there, uh, you have to come into it with some passion or talent or knowledge or you know, you're going to have to put into it as much as you get out. Yes, absolutely. So for Rash and Clank. Up your arsenal, vote. RPR. Uh, all right, hold on. It's hard, isn't it, motherfucker? Getting late. For Rash and Clank, up your arsenal. Vo wow, I'm really <laughs> screwing this up. For Rash and Clank, up your arsenal. Developer commentary. Very special episode. Uh, I am Tony Garcia. And I am so fucking happy. I'm Mike Stout. And we will see you next time. Yes! God damn, my garage band is like like stalling out right now. It's this track is so long.